the conversations I was having, we were talking about camaraderie and team building. And one of the participants said, yeah, you know, we're, we're using Snapchat, you know, and I, and I kind of stepped back from that for a, for a second and said, you know, as a 55 year old technologist, I would have never thought of using Snapchat as a team building tool. But this huh. younger generation, sure. that's what they, they took it upon themselves to say, hey, we're gonna build camaraderie amongst our, ourselves using that tool. Hey, I'm Armando LaDuke, producer, film actor, and owner of LaDuke Entertainment. I have chosen a life off the beaten path and wanted to find others that are doing the same. Spaghetti on the Wall is a show based on all of the years that I've thrown spaghetti on the wall and nurtured what's stuck. We will share fun stories, ideas, tips, tricks, and more. Welcome to Spaghetti on the Wall. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, wrong one. Oh, oh. Nope. There we go. <laughs> welcome to Spaghetti on the Wall, ladies and gentlemen. Today I have owner of Transformix, Jim DuBose, thank you so much for being on the show today. I'm excited. Thanks for inviting me. Great. Uh, so are you from Baton Rouge? I am. Grew up in, in Baton Rouge. Um, born and raised? Born in Little Rock, Arkansas. Six okay. months old, came to, to Louisiana. My dad's family's from New Orleans, and so been here my basically my whole professional life, working life. Very cool. And so you started Transformix in when? So Transformix, I merged a company in 2010 mm -hmm. uh, with Transformix with two other individuals here. And uh, it's been an amazing journey. You know, Transformix is a 30 year old company that's been through a couple of chapters in its life. Mm -hmm. Right. 2010, I like to say, was really that second chapter of Transformix. You know? And so were you an IT guy? Is that why you? Yeah, I mean, I've been a geek my whole life, a recovering geek, as they say. Uh, but that's really the only industry that I've ever, you know, ever worked in. And it's been a tremendous career. I think for anyone looking or trying to figure out what do I, what do I want to do, if you like a fast pace, lots of change, lots of opportunity, the technology industry is just a tremendous Yeah, it's industry. just growing yeah. on and on and on. So when you, how did you get into IT? So funny story. I was in landscape architecture at LSU and hmm. realized that I didn't want to do landscaping for the rest of my life and came across a, uh, at that time it was a trade school because the community college system didn't exist back in the, in the eighties. And it was basically a, a, a two year trade school on computer maintenance and technology. Mm -hmm. And that's, I went and investigated the course enrolled, dropped out of LSU. My parents thought I had lost my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I got introduced to technology, just fell in love with it. And um, that was the beginning. So as a as an owner of a tech company, are you still doing tech? Not anymore. I mean, I, I, I'm probably more focused on the day to day running of the business than anything else. Um, I, I do a lot of the strategy for the company, I call mm -hmm. it reading the technology tea leaves. Even though we're in the deep south and we don't do hockey, we uh, we talk about where's the puck going to go. Right. And and part of I think the art of, of being a business owner in this in this field is really trying to help your customers understand where is technology going to be in the next 12, 18, 24 months, so that they you know they can properly plan. And that for me has been kind of the probably the central part of my professional life for the last ten years. Have you always been a strategist? Yes. Okay. Yeah. In, in the early days of my career, I was an engineer, just like a normal engineering resource, uh, predominantly on the telecommunications and infrastructure side. Mm -hmm. um, but very much thinking, always thinking about where's the next iteration of technology gonna, you know, gonna be. And I, I've been very fortunate, you know, in the early days, it was kind of personal computer networking and then client server computing and then the internet, you know, dot com, you know, evolution. Now we see, I, I call it the consumerization of technology where we all walk around with a computer that also happens to make telephone calls. Right. Right. And so this connectedness between the consumer individual experience and the expectation of what's my life going to be like in my work environment and how those worlds have come come together. So it's been very fascinating, you know, over the course of the years. How do you stay hip to everything? 
to the news. I read a lot. I'm a yeah. I'm an insatiable. You know, I, I I read a lot. Um, you know, my team will tell you that they get emails from me at all hours of the day and night um, because I read a lot. And it to me, it's really important to stay abreast of what's happening in the industry. And as you have different areas, let's take artificial intelligence as a great example where, you know, five years ago, we may not have been talking about AI. Today, we're talking about AI in a real world sense, it being applied to real world problems, right? Yeah. And so I think it's really important that you stay abreast of what's happening because innovation is gonna continually happen in this industry. And so that's the, you know, for me, the secret is you gotta be a, you gotta be, someone who's willing to learn and invest time in learning. What were the last five books you read? Oh, goodness. Um, I would tell you that my business book, I'm a, I'm a, a business book guy. I love Patrick Lencioni. I think he's just a tremendous author, um, particularly for leadership characteristics and developing teams. I like Vern Harnish. Um, I read a lot of Vern. Um, uh, you know, the Harvard Business Review is something that I, you know, I've subscribed to and, and read for years just because there's a lot of content from a variety of authors that come into that, into that space. And so if I'm, you know, I'm thinking about an HR related matter or I'm thinking about um, new forms of sales and marketing, um, there's those types of, of resources, I think, are invaluable to business owners because you get a, a collection of a lot of different inputs. Um, but yeah, so for me, it's been business, you know, business books predominantly. And then, like I said, this Harvard Business Review. You ever attend any masterminds? I have. I have. I've attended several. Um, you know, I think some of them, you know, you have to be very, I think, selective. And, you know, for me, it's investigating the author in the background of the, of the presenter to really make sure that you're going to connect with them. Um, because they're an investment both in time and money. Sure. And so being sure that, okay, is this going to, you know, deliver, you know, to me the benefit that I'm seeking? Um, I, I'll use an example. I was, one of the things that I do with my team is I do a lunch, a couple of lunches every month with just team members. And we pull team members from different areas in the business, people who would not normally interact with each other, mm -hmm. sit them down with a lunch with me. And we just talk about all types of things, a lot of internal dialogue about just operational related items and that type of stuff. And I think that's really Im important. And, you know, one of the conversations I was having, we were talking about camaraderie and team building. And one of the participants said, yeah, you know, we're, we're using Snapchat, you know, and I, and I kind of stepped back from that for a, for a second and said, you know, as a 55 year old technologist, I would have never thought of using Snapchat as a team building tool. But this huh. younger generation, sure. that's what they, they took it upon themselves to say, hey, we're gonna build camaraderie amongst our, ourselves using that tool. So it's just really cool. So did experience. they like start a group? Yeah, they started a little group amongst themselves just and building so they're camaraderie. Just talking, they're just, know, talking just talking Snapchatting and, and just building camaraderie within the team environment, which I thought was really neat. You know? So is that the, uh, so that, that's a question I was gonna ask you. What's the secret to keeping you know, employees for a long term, you know, it, it's look, I, I think that I, I stole a, a, an expression from Richard Branson, you know, take care of your employees, because they take care of your customers. And I think it's probably the most critical piece of any company, because you could have, you know, if you think about technology companies, we all have a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. So what makes one better than the other? It's the team. It's the people. The people, right? And so if you're going to recruit and retain, you really have to, number one, focus on them and make sure that the team feels like you're, you're really sincerely interested in their outcome. Um, we have an internal uh, mantra we call hashtag come be awesome. And it started from kind of this recruiting idea of how do we – recruit and communicate to an external, you know, potential employee about the company, but it's really kind of morphed into a culture, right? Right. Where, you know, we do a hashtag come be awesome award once a year and it's a vote. It's a vote by the team for a peer. That's cool. And they vote for the person they think is the most has the most attributes associated with hashtag come be awesome, right? And, and it's been pretty remarkable. We have a board, we call it the wall of fame, you know, of hashtag come be awesome award winners. And that has really meant a lot to the team members because they know that they're really 
the ones driving the customer experience. Sure. You know, so. When the pandemic hit, everybody started working remotely, yeah. right? When did you guys come back full, full, full on? So, I, I mean, we're not back 100% now. Okay. But, um, we, we, when the pandemic came in, obviously, like a lot of businesses, we were probably better equipped just because by the nature of the, of the company. Right. Right. I mean, we do predominantly our, our uh, service rendering, 80% of what we do gets done remotely. And so we had the tools, we had the security components, we had all of those things already set up, the voice communications. So we knew that we could function very well. Obviously, we operate a data center here at our location in Baton Rouge. So, you know, the facilities team and those core operations folks still had to be present to sure. run the facility. Absolutely. But by and large, 95% of the team were all sent home and working, working remotely. The interesting thing was, the call volume increased by about 400% over Ooh. normal. Right, because now everybody's on Everybody's computers. at home. They, they really probably weren't as prepared, right, to work from home full time. And so you're working through all those dynamics of helping your customer communities be able to operate their businesses in the same way. So the you pandemic know? was good for you. It was, it was good. It was stressful, obviously. Yeah. But it was good in the sense that it, it really helped – customers think about business continuity, resiliency in their businesses, making sure they had the right components in place to be able to sustain, you know, their, their organizations. And so there was a lot of positives that came, you know, that came out of that. You know, for me, probably the proudest piece is that no layoffs of employees, 100% retention. Wow. You know, we really focused on what I like to refer to as as social decisions, not business decisions with our employees. Right. And made sure that they had everything they needed, that they were comfortable, they felt safe, secure, those things. Because we were all going through a stress moment, right? And, yeah. and trying to figure out what does this mean for the long term, right? So that was our goal. So when you started putting this, you, you said 2010, right, is when you... Yeah. That's when we merged. That's when I merged the company. Got gotcha. you. What were you doing before 10? Um, well, I had, I had uh, sold a business years back. Then for a very short period of time, I was in state government as a CIO for the state of Louisiana under Governor Foster. That's when I learned that I want to serve the public anonymously, right? <laughs> right. And, and, I, um, and then from, 20, from, from that time forward, about 10 years, I operated a private, uh, a private business consulting business company called Dubois and Associates. And then when, when my daughters decided to come back to, to go to college here at LSU, we followed them back and, and opened uh, a, a managed services company that we ended up merging with, uh, with Transformix. So you were consulting businesses? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my whole life. That's all it's, that's all it's been. You know, for, you for, for, 30, for 33 years, 27 of it has been as an entrepreneur in some way, shape, or form, owning, owning companies. Are you still mentoring people? I do. I, you know, that's one of the probably the, the proudest pieces of my own, you know, experiences, you know, and people who know me know that I like to use the word opportunity. Right. Right. I, because I feel like regardless of whether or not a person is working with me, stays with me or moves on to another component, you know, another opportunity in their life, I want to help them achieve whatever personal goals they have. And, sure. and, and when I look at back at my, my lifespan of, of businesses, many of the people who are here in Transformix today were former team members of, of mine and other companies and previous companies, which is really to me just a testament of having that type of an attitude, being unselfish and making sure that you're thinking about their well-being first. And that served me really, really well. So when you started putting sort of your SOPs together, was it you that was doing the SOPs? Did you know, or were you just like, okay, I'm going to hire the people that know what they're doing and they're going to create it for me? So in the, in, you're talking about in 2010 when we, sure, yeah. yeah. So in, in 2010, the, the phrase managed service provider was a very new experience. Right. Prior to that, it was all about professional services, hourly billing, that type of an approach to services. Managed services kind of began what I call the IT as a service type of an approach where I, I'm trying to flatline my expense model as a business mm -hmm. so I know how much I, my costs are going to be every month, right? The normalization of expenses around IT. 
And so that was the very beginning of that, uh, that journey. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, in the beginning, it was difficult for business owners to really even think about changing the buying pattern. But over time now, it's the way that people want to buy. Right, it's the way to, way yeah, to go. So way how to did go. you, do, so somebody had, <clears throat> had to have been pioneering that right? Who, who was, who well, was it was just that? industry, right? So it was, it was part of it is just being in this industry and seeing the, the request and listening to your customers and them, you know, talk about kind of the ebb and flow of expenses associated with, you know, technology and can we flatline it? Can we make it more normal and predictable right. every month? And so that was really just, I think as an industry, everyone was listening to these requests from customers and going, okay, there's got to be a way to make this a reality for Instead them. of a la carte. Right. right. You know, and so that was really the beginning of that. So I'd say really in the 2009, 2008 timeframe is when we really started seeing that type of uh, a transition. That's when the transition really began to, to happen. What is Transformix's <laughs> bread and butter, would you say? You know, I, I tell people that of all the companies that I've been associated with, Transformix does more than any company I've ever been associated with. So we have a tremendous set of offerings to customers. If you think about, I'm gonna call technology in vertical stacks, you really have enterprise engineering, which is kind of the wired and wireless technology. You have collaboration, which is your voice in virtual meeting environments, those types of things. You have IT and cybersecurity as a, as a component, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have data center and cloud. Those four verticals are really the things that we've, we have offerings inside of those four areas. And then mm -hmm. we wrap them in professional and managed services for customers just based on what their needs are. So it's a, it's a very complex business, but it's a very flexible business. So regardless of who I'm interacting with, it may be what their priorities are for that given point in time, I generally am gonna have something that I can, I can offer to them. Very cool. What's, uh, how, how, why Transformix, how did that name come about? You know, Transformix was just an iteration over the course of years. And so as the company changed, went from an earlier generation, it, it was really kind of this transformative effect, right? What does it mean to transform? You know, and we've kind of felt like it was a, an ongoing motion for our customer. And so that's where the name, you know, that's where the name came from. So where do you see the um, sort of the tech space moving into in the next five years? Well, I think there's a number of things. I mean, I, I think cybersecurity is here to stay. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, you know, we just recently saw something, I think it was Robin Hood that had a hundred million, you know, they said names and email addresses, but I'm not so sure that's all the data just yet. I think they're probably still trying to figure out yeah. what really was in that, you know, in that package, if you will. Mm -hmm. But you see this, con this ongoing, uh, security issue, right? The federal government with, you know, some of the hacks that have made the news in, in recent months. I think that it just demonstrates that that piece of the, of the puzzle has to be at the forefront because it's really not about them in most cases wanting to steal your data. It's about disruption and extortion. Right. 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 So really fundamentally it's about, I just want to put your business on pause, generate pain for you so that you're willing to pay me to, pay you enough to, to release it. it right. Oof. And, and so, you know, we've got a, you know, a very heavy focus on cybersecurity just because we believe it's non-negotiable. Um, I think the evolution of the cloud and particularly with 5G and the speeds that are associated now with, with wireless communications over 5G, you kind of have this ubiquitous access to data. Right. So I can get to data from anywhere now. Right. And in the pandemic is kind of a proof of that where you see this this connectivity explosion, people being able to operate in completely different models than they did before. And it's really because the bandwidth has allowed us to do that along with the technologies. Right. So to me, this ubiquitous access, remote work, hybrid work, whatever phrase we want to use is 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 here to stay. And so really it's thinking about your business and going, well, how does my business change because of this environment? Um, you know, can I recruit differently? 
Do I have new, you know, offers that I didn't have the ability to offer before? Mm -hmm. Um, My dad, you know, was in sales for a long time and, and he, he used an expression that I like to, uh, to keep, which is people, you know, business owners spend money for one of three reasons to make money, to save money or to mitigate a risk. And those three things are, to me, really, really powerful. And I think regardless of what you're engaged in, when I think about that, that's how I'm always thinking about if I can't identify the why a customer's doing something, I need to stop. I need to stop and help them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're just going to spend money and then ultimately they're going to be mad because they spent money and they really didn't understand the reason Why? why. Yeah. Right. So I thought it was, you know, something that's really interesting, you know, that from a business perspective, you got to understand the why as a customer, you know, executing. And the pain point. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you see Transformix expanding past Baton Rouge or? Yeah, I mean, if I look at the state of Louisiana, I mean, I'm proud to tell people that Louisiana has been a tremendous state for me personally and professionally. Uh, and, And, you know, sometimes we get a bad rap you know, as a state, um, but just a tremendous business community. Um, community is very loyal. Um, they want to, they want to work with people that they, you know, that, that they like, right. So very relationship oriented. Um, you know, 90% of our customers originate out of the four walls of this state, although we service, you know, customers all over the world, but they all originate here. Um, I can definitely see us migrating. You know, we had intended to, tr- you know, travel a little bit down the, you know, I would say east down I-10 um, pre-pandemic. Mm-hmm. Obviously paused, right, when the pandemic came. But we, we see a tremendous opportunity, you know, for a company like Transformix to continue to grow. So, And what does that look, look, what does that look like for you personally? Like, how does that, how, how do you stay... Is that you just stay in that strategizing? Yeah, I mean, for me, for me, it's just making sure that we have the things that we need to be successful for customers. So as you know, we grow our sales team or we try to grow our engineering teams. Do we have the things in place to be able to sustain that growth? In many cases, if I look at the growth over the last 10 years, one of the underlying things you have to think about is when you reach a certain size, are my internal systems capable of sustaining my next phase of growth? And that, those are really, really important you know, decisions because what will happen is you'll outgrow your ability to execute from a systems perspective. Right. You, know, you may have the best team in the world. You may have all those things. But if your internal systems can't process in an efficient way, it's going to be very tough. So how yeah. are you scaling? Well, properly? it's just investment, right? It's right. investment, right? You make, you make the right investments at the right time. Again, thinking about this is where we want to go from an execution side. What are the pieces that you have to replace in order to be able to provide the level of services that you, that you need to for your customers? So you're reverse engineering it. Yeah, you have to in some ways. I mean, you're looking in, you know, but you also have, you know, the opportunity. We have peers in the industry. You know, in many cases, we're not the first one doing something. So we can have dialogue in a non-competitive way with peers around the around the you know the U.S. and the in the world. What are others doing to solve certain problems? How so do you start that conversation, or do you already have relationships? Yeah, I mean, you have relationships over the course of decades. You build relationships, and you take those relationships and and say, "Hey, I'm trying to solve X problem. What have you guys done?" And it's just a networking of communication. That makes sense. So, if you have and I'm sure you guys have the analytics, you guys are going, okay, we can service this amount of these amount of customers with this, with this staff. So in order to like really move up to the next level, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, um, in each one of the business units, we have what we refer to them as just KPI, right? Just core performance indicators that are going to tell us, you know, those moments to hire. Right. So whatever's driving the metric, mm-hmm. right, whatever, you know, whatever analytics you're using to drive those metrics is going to be driving your hiring moments. Right. So over time, you mature the practices to kind of know what are the metrics, what are the things that are going to drive the hiring moments and you just be ready. Right. With with uh, I tell people we have an expression internally because they build your bench. You know, and building your bench really just means having people ready 
to either elevate team members that are already inside the four walls that want to take a step up Mm -hmm. or externally be recruiting and have those you know ready ready team members to come on board when you're when the time is right do you have like do you guys have a consistent i guess head hunting process that you guys never stop yeah just never stop it's always recruiting you know and recruiting is sales it's just in a different form right i'm selling i'm selling the company to a potential employee versus selling the company to a customer Right. But you're still presenting because it's competitive. Right. I mean, it's a competitive job market. So they have to really understand why would this be the right decision for them? And really, it's connecting the personal success drivers with the opportunities inside the company. You know, right. That's really cool. I hadn't really thought about that. So you read a lot. What do you do for fun? Well, I have a lot of children. So my wife and I have six children. I have one, one wife, six kids, right? 33 years of marriage is one of the proudest things that I have about, about my personal life. And so super busy with kid activities, right? Mm-hmm. So the fun is everybody had a successful weekend and we get to relax, right? Um, but no, we, we do a lot of sports, a lot of uh, family activities. We like to boat, you know, we're a boating family. Um, the kids are old enough now where they all water ski and do all those kinds of things. So those are the things that we like to, that we like to do. Travel. Do you guys like traveling? Yeah. Not in recent years, obviously with the pandemic, but, um, you know, we absolutely love to love to travel. Where's the next place? I'd like to go back to Western Europe. Um, I've been to, to Rome and to Spain and in some of those areas before, um, this, you know, my, my younger children have gotten old enough now where I think they could appreciate some of the histor- historical aspects of that kind of a trip. And that's something that we'd like to, that we'd like to do. You a history guy? I am. I love history. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, what part of history you think like interests you the most? Well, I mean, there's a lot, of, and that's a broad question. You sure. know, I, I think <laughs> I, I think about, I love American history, you know, particularly post, you know, the Civil War, because I think it's very interesting to see how the country, you know, specifically the U.S., has, I would say, changed in certain generations and eras, right? Mm-hmm. Um, particularly post World War II and some of those eras, you know, as 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 the the economy and the underlying engine has changed, right? Moving from an agricultural to an industrial, you know, economy now to a digital information, you know, economy. I find it very interesting. Um, I also think the 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 just the human dynamics are also interesting, right? I mean, some people refer to it as pop culture. I think some of that is very interesting to understand what is driving some of that change, right? And people from one generation to another. I mean, all, all everybody's parents looks at us like, you know, what is your generation doing? Right, right. right? But there are underlying drivers behind that. And what is it that, that is, is uh, making people think differently? I find that fascinating. Do you think that... I feel like people are like, oh, things are, you know, things are getting really crazy. And I'm like, well, haven't things always been crazy in some aspect or another? Yeah, like- I think I think a little bit of what took place, if you think about the pandemic, we, we kind of <laughs> removed the we removed ourselves from the humanity for a minute. Right. We kind of mm-hmm. isolated for a good reason. Right. You know, a virus we couldn't control. And when that isolation happened, we look for sources of other sources of fulfillment right? So social media was a natural place to go. And there's a lot of great things in social media, right? There's also a lot of challenging things. And I think that generated a little bit of challenging. Do you mean bad? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, bad, (laughs) or maybe just maybe just feeding yourself with information that maybe you wouldn't normally get, because you wouldn't be spending that much time in it. I, I like right. how you phrase challenge, though, instead of... It, I, I say it's challenge. I use that word challenge because you have to know how to control your reaction to it, hmm. right? So it's a challenge for myself because if, I spend, if I'm spending more time in a medium that I wouldn't normally do, and I'm getting all this digital information that I wouldn't normally receive, right. well, then how do I process it, right? And so I think, I think that's part of the dynamic is that some of the some of the the after effects of the pandemic is just having to to remove ourselves a little bit from the from the isolation that we were in and learn how to reconnect humanly 
with people, right? Replace the, the, the digital world back with the human world and have those human relationships. Because ultimately, I think that's what really drives, you know, people. Sure. Uh, you know, as you want to have those relationships with, you know, with friends and family. And when you go into isolation, you just look for other sources of... Sure, of connection. Connection, yeah. So do you think that... Because, I mean, you know, I, I see my, my niece who's, you know, 18 and she's going to LSU and social media is like the life. You know what I mean? I'm like, okay, are, are we seeing them, are we seeing more of a disconnect happening as the, you know, as, as kids are getting more used to these phones earlier on? And are well, we, I'll, I'll use, you know, I have my, my children's age range from 32 to 11. Okay. So I've kind of been through some generational, sure. I'm having generational experiences right now. Right. And so I have two married, two older married children with wow. kids and, and grandchildren and all that stuff. But I also have younger teenagers. And I see the differences in their own experience, right? My older daughter's experience versus my younger children's experience. And to me, it's really just about very focused parenting, making sure that we, we have a balanced life for them, right? So they may have a a, a hobby or a club or a group that they're in. They're all in music. They do their gaming, you know, they enjoy their, their, their games, you know, but they have, you know, human relationships, right? To make sure that they have a balanced existence. And that to me would be the most important thing is that when you're interacting or you're, you're looking at how, you know, children or, or young people are, are interacting is making sure they stay humanly connected. And it doesn't just become this digital world because the digital world's not real. Right. Right. It's, yeah, it's not I real. I know a friend of mine is, is caught up in virtual reality and yeah. like, I don't it, know. It's not real, anymore. right? It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not real, but, but that's as a, as a parent, that's how I've tried to help my, my children. And when we have young employees, I, I accept the fact that the Snapchats and the Facebooks and, you know, Instagram and all those components are just part of their natural existence. We don't have rules against those applications during working hours, you know, but the way we manage it is by the expectation of what they need to execute on a day in, day out basis. Right. That right. comes back to the KPIs. Yeah. Right. Are you executing at the level you need to for the given role that you're in inside the company? Right. right? And I think as, as young people go through college and they come out of college and come into the professional world, they're going to go through that experience, sure. right? Employers are going to have expectations, you know, so. What's the, uh, what, do you, what do you think education is going to be like in the future? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, my wife and I have, have done a combination of homeschooling and traditional schooling our whole life. And the homeschooling aspect, I was blessed to marry a teacher. She's the daughter of teachers. So she's an educator by, by trade, you know, graduated in education. And so we always looked at the needs of each child individually. And that to me is, That's cool. is probably the most important element is, are we meeting the need of the child? Because every child's unique. I had a, I have one of my daughters that was uh, dyslexic, had very particular learning requirements. I have another child with a learning disability that has very particular learning requirements. And so, you, you know, when you throw, a, throw kids into kind of this blender of everybody's going to get educated the same, it, it doesn't, doesn't work, work for everyone, right? right? It doesn't right. work just because we're all unique creatures. So for me, it's how do you customize education so that you meet the needs of the person, right? Some of us learn better reading, others are visual, others are experiential as examples, right? right. And so what is the form of that education and are you meeting the need of that, of that, of that child or that person um, so that they can excel? So that'd be kind of cool. That, that to me is that, that to me should be the goal for education, right? Is, sure. is, is creating those opportunities so that young people learn in the way that's most productive for them. For them. Yeah. Right. I agree with you hundred yeah. percent. Um, on that note, we're going to roll Jim. That was fantastic, man. I really nice appreciate to meet you, it. Thank you so much for You're being welcome. on the show. Um, please. If you guys are in need of cybersecurity, um, managed service providing um contact transformix at transformix.com correct yeah correct and um you know and jim um great guy great great interview man thank you uh, I, I love i love the brain i love what's going on You're so welcome. i appreciate it i'll see y'all next time spaghetti on the wall